Joshua chapter number 10. Begin reading verse number 9. <clears throat> the Bible says, Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. Demoli I'm sorry, hang on. And the Lord discomforted them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them along the way that goeth up to Beth Horon and smote them to Azekah and unto Makeda. And it came to pass as they fled from before Israel and were in the going down to Beth Horon that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah and they died. They were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Then Joshua spake, then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it. And the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Now, we don't have time to get into all the history of what's going on here. But, if we start at the beginning of the chapter, you find that five kings are engaged in a battle against Gibeon. Then, eventually... It comes down to verse number 9. It says, Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. Joshua gets news. I believe it's in verse number 6. Okay, saying, hey, Gibeon's in uh, trouble. Okay, you're camped over in Gilgal. And he says, come up to us quickly. And save us, help us, for all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. So Joshua takes all the strong men, the mighty men of valor, the people that have been proven in combat prior to this, and he says, let's go. But here's the thing, they weren't that close. Sounded like they were just right next door, like, hey, can we have a cup of sugar? No. Verse number 9 tells us that Joshua and the band didn't say that they walked, they rode all night but how'd they get there I don't know if it's chariots don't know if it's on the back of a horse or a donkey or whatever it was but they weren't walking they was moving they was trucking and it still took them all night to get there so then they find out verse number 10 as they've been riding all night they've been trying to essentially cover as much ground as they can and hope to get there in time so that they can even help. They don't know if they can make it in time, but they know they're going to get there as quick as they can. And they know that the armies have already started against their allies, or else they wouldn't have called for help. They said, hey, woo, we got a whole bunch of kings coming our way. And we aren't able to defend ourselves. Maybe they could defend themselves against one king. Right? They weren't able to defend against multiple kings of the Amorites at once. Each of them had their own armies. Each of them could have besieged the city. Now imagine you got four armies outside of your door and all of them were wanting a piece of you. Right? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. What's that mean? As long as there's still an Israelite in the, in the midst of them, they're all going to be fighting to destroy the Israelite. Doesn't matter that they're not all under the same king or the same ruler all they know is, is we hate them and as long as you want to destroy them we're fine with you it's all out war if they had their way the Amorites would have razed the city wouldn't have had anything left not one stone standing upon another as the Bible says in several instances it would have looked like a wasteland a ghost town you might have been able to ride through and say well you could tell that there was a city here once but you can't tell much about it. What do people do? I don't know. There's no trace of them. That the enemy wanted to utterly destroy 
Israel. But it says that God discomforted them. What's that mean? That means that all night while Joshua and all the men of war are riding as hard as they can, and as the Israelites are trying to make their best defensive stand, God just starts messing with the enemy a little bit. What's he do? He gets them nervous. He gets them rattled. At one moment, Dave's ready to... Right? Every single one of them was saying, yeah, let's charge in. If I'm the only one, I'm going to charge in there. They had that pride that Goliath had. Right? When he's standing out in the middle of the valley cursing God and cursing God's people, he says, who among you is you know, strong enough to come up and fight me? He says, you don't have to whoop the whole army. You just got to whoop me. The thing was that Goliath knew there wasn't a man in and of himself that could have whooped him. It took God to kill that giant. But he's saying, but one minute, they had all the bravado. They had all the confidence. They was ready to walk in and siege this city, take it, jump over walls, tear them down, whatever they had to do. But then God starts working on them a little bit. But do you think? Next thing you know, the enemy's not so sure of themselves. Next thing you know, enemies starting to say, well, you sure this guy knows what he's doing? What do he do? I don't know. I just know that he did something to him. But it says that he went against them, or after them, chased them, all along the way that goeth up to Beth Horon, and smote them to Azekadah, or Azeka, and Makeda. What are you saying? The whole way God's harrying them. That's a military term. What's he doing? He's just doing enough against them to keep them running. He doesn't let up the attack. He's trying to wear them out. Okay, that's what they say hunting dogs are used for in a lot of situations. They run the prey. What do they do? They get it worn out. It's meant to spook them and get them running so that when the hunter gets there, it doesn't have any energy left. It can't go anymore. It's tired. But what's God doing? God hadn't smote them yet what's he doing he's just pushing them in a certain direction he's herding them to meet Joshua now verse number 11 came to pass as they fled from before Israel and they were in the going down to Beth Horon that the Lord cast great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah and they died what happens? Joshua gets there, counteroffensive happens. They say, uh uh, we're done. Right? We could have taken them if it wasn't for just the city, but Joshua, no. So they start running. God's harrying them the whole way. And then eventually God gets them down to where he wants them, and he opens up the sky. What's he do? He starts raining hail down upon them. It says hailstones. Okay, but verse number 11 tells us, And they died. They were more which died with hailstones than whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. What happened? God finished the battle. But, Joshua, keep this mindset in mind. He just rode all night. They've been running trying to get and help defend the city. They get there. They get no rest. They got to go right into fighting. And they say, all right, boys, you want to fight? Let's fight. And then what happens? A little bit of fighting happens, and then the enemy starts running away. Then Joshua thinks, ah, here we go again. They goes, just when we was about ready to get them all, right, the enemy finds a way to slip on out before you can take care of them. Right, they've been weasels is what they've been. But it didn't take much for them to tuck tail and turn. They knew who Joshua was. They knew that Joshua doesn't show up with any wimps to fight alongside him. They had heard about how God had used Joshua throughout all of Canaan land. Right while Moses was still the leader of God's people, Joshua was their general. You find every battle, where's Joshua at? He's down there in the fight. 
Joshua was just a slave in Egypt. What happened? God taught him how to fight. And he learned how to fight the right way. Which is, Lord, I'm going to do all I can, but it's in your hands. He says, if you tell us to go fight, we're going to fight. If you tell us not to fight, we're not going to fight. But if you tell us to fight, we're going to give it everything we got because we know that you're on our side. He says, if you're on our side, no enemy can stand against us. But God knows. These Amorites, they make it all the way back to their kingdom. They get all the way back to their home. It may be a year, maybe two years, maybe ten years, maybe a hundred years, but eventually they're going to rise up and they're going to come back and they're going to fight against God's people. Joshua knows that. If Joshua just wanted to defend the city, why is he running after them when they fled? He wasn't there for a defensive mission. He was there to destroy the enemies of God's people. So when they tuck tail and turn, he says, Boys, I know we rode all night. We got here and we fought hard. I know y'all are tired, but now we got to go chase them down. We can't let them get away because if they get away, they'll be back. So what do they do? They chase after them. And then eventually, God's harrying them the whole way. Don't know about you, but if the enemy is running away full speed and you're running full speed to catch them, you're not the one that's you know, not chucking rocks at them while you're running. You're just trying to keep pace. You're trying to keep from losing the scent. They can't do nothing about the enemies in front of them. They just fought. Now they're running again. Riding whatever it is. They're following these guys. And they say at the end of this long run, there's going to be another fight. And they know if it gets down to nighttime, these suckers are going to be able to get away. Why is that? Because they had already ridden all night. They got there and they had fought. Now they're riding for who knows how long. Could be all day. But he knows that his men are about out of energy. And he says, Lord, if this goes on any much longer, my boys aren't going to be able to do this. He says, they showed up and they fought. That's what I asked them to do. Now, they got to go do this, and none of them quit on me. They all came with me, and they're all running as hard as they can. And they're doing the right thing. They're trying to take care of the enemies of God's people. They want to protect their brothers and their sisters, right? Their cousins, their fellow Israelites. And they know that if they don't take care of this situation, it's going to be worse next time. And as Joshua's thinking all that, what happens? God just opens up the sky and starts hurling rocks at them. Because they can't fight them. They're running full speed. All Joshua's thinking about is, man, this is going to be a bad fight once we get to the end of it. Both of us are going to be tired. Son's going to be, they're going to be trying to run. Any chance they get, they're going to break and we're going to have to chase them down again. He says, we've already gone a whole day without sleep. Right? It's one thing to go a day without sleep if you don't do nothing. Right there, if y'all hyped up on caffeine and sugar and everything else, energy drinks, what are they hyped up on? In it, adrenaline. thing about adrenaline is when it wears off, you crash. Just like sugar. Why like kids bounce off the walls for about 20 minutes and then they're in a coma for two hours afterwards. Right? It's the crash. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying these guys, their bodies are failing them. It's not their spirit that's failing them. It's their body. Spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Ever heard that? Trust not in the arm of flesh. Why? Because it will fail you. You got limits. You say, well, I may not have been doing that much. You've still got a limit. But these guys have been giving it everything they got, and their gas tank's about empty. God knows it. God knows everything that Joshua knows about this enemy. And if they get away, they're going to come back and it's going to be worse the next time. So what's God start doing? He just starts discomforting. What's he do? He throws some rocks down at them. What's he do? It causes them to split up into groups. They're not organized anymore. 
Instead of running in one group, now you got guys wondering where everybody else is. They stop running. Why? Because they're looking around. What happens? More rocks hit them. Well, how many rocks did God throw down at these Amorites? Well, it says that God killed more of them with hailstones than Joshua and his men killed with the sword. But he's saying God won the battle. Joshua didn't win this day. The Israelites didn't win this day. The Amorites didn't lose this day. God had it all in his hand from the beginning. And God knew what the outcome was going to be. But, look with me, verse number 12, Then Joshua, then spake Joshua to the Lord, In the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. Now, verse number 13 tells us that the sun stood still and the moon stayed till the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. How long does the sun stay up? Long as they needed it to? How many did they kill? Not as many as God had killed. But God let them finish what they started. God could have rained hailstones all down from heaven. Wiped all of them out in one instance. God could have done this. And there would have been no history that they ever existed. God didn't have to. But why did God allow it to happen? God had just done something. For Israel. What did he do? He gave them a chance to finally win. Joshua knew we're running out of time. We're running out of steam. We're running out of, you know, just the ability to go out and fight. Now eventually these guys are going to hit that invisible wall and they're not going to have no more in the tank. And they're still chasing. They haven't even caught them yet. And he's thinking, man, they're running out. Running out of steam. What God do? God did for them what they couldn't do for themselves. But what does Joshua say before all the people of Israel? But in his heart, really, what he says, son, stand thou still. Why? Because if the sun goes down, they're going to get away. We've already talked about it. If darkness falls, them suckers aren't going to be able to find out where all of them snuck around in the woods in the middle of the night and made their escape. As long as the sun's up and as long as they can see them, they're going to be able to take care of them. But he says, stand thus still. Then he says, tells the moon, right, stand in the valley of Agilon. He says, and the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. It didn't stay there any longer than it had to, but it stayed there every second that it had to. Why? What Joshua was saying is, Lord, the day is yours. You won. But there's still some left, and God's people want to do something for you. God's people want to do something for themselves. Lord, we wouldn't have won today without you, and you, you, we could win the day with us doing nothing else. If we just stopped here, you could wipe the rest of them off the map. But these people... They got something that they got to deal with. Notice, it says in verse number 13, that the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. There was a score that had to be settled. Deep in their hearts, they were all grieved. They were broken. Why? Because the enemy had taken from them right, lives, things, land, they're heartbroken at what has happened to their brethren. What do they want? They say, Lord, just give us a chance to even the score. You've already won the day. God's killed more of them with hailstones than he has, you know, Joshua and his men have with swords. They're beat. They're running away. Joshua's saying, Lord, just give us enough time to let them know who God's people really are. We're not cowards. We didn't show up just to scare them off. We showed up to finish it. Essentially, they're saying, Lord, give us a chance to walk over there, kick them in the kneecap and say, if you can't finish it, don't start it. 
Or if you start it, we're going to finish it. What's Joshua saying? He's saying, Lord, let us send them a message. Let's let them know that you got to do more than just bring five kings, pray to all your false gods. He says, even tired after riding all night, fighting all day. Lord, let the sun stay up there because if the nighttime comes, they're going to sneak away. But just give us a chance to walk over there, settle the debt. All right, put them in their place. What's he saying? Lord, let's take care of this today so that we don't have to take care of it tomorrow. That's what he's saying. Lord, I don't want to fight them tomorrow. I don't want to track them down tomorrow. We got better things to do. We is down there in the valley, right? We is about your business. And then these knuckleheads came in, wanted to start a fight. So what they do? They said, all right, boys, let's leave it. Let's go take care of business. Joshua said, Lord, let's take care of business today so that tomorrow we can get back to what you want us to be doing, what you intended us to be doing. Well, verse number 14 tells us, there was no day like that before or after, that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. So, Did God have to do it? No. But God heard Joshua's prayer. And he said, even though you're tired, even though the gas tank's about empty, because you've got enough gumption to want to do it, I'll just hold the sun right here for a little bit so that y'all can fight in the sunshine. So that you can finish it today. Essentially what God's saying is, I'm putting the sun there and holding it here so that you can have victory. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next month. Victory today. So that when you turn around and you're tired and you're walking back home or you're riding back home after you've been chasing these guys essentially for two days at this point, he says, I'll just make this day last a little bit longer so that when you walk back, you men can hold your heads high. They don't feel like failures. They've got victory in their soul. They can go back and tell people, we got them. Right, Y'all remember that when they announced that Osama bin Laden had finally been, 10 years later, they finally called him? What did the guy say? He said, we got them. Took us a while, but everybody that remembers seeing the towers fall, we got the sucker who was responsible for that. Did you get all of them? We got the one that counted. We promised we'd get them, and we got them. The Lord's saying, we'll let your men go home, Joshua, and tell everybody else. It took us a while. God had to hold the sun in the sky so that we had enough time in the day to do it, but we got them. They're not going to be a problem no more. God threw hailstones down and killed the ones that were too big for us so that we could handle business. What happened after Goliath was slain? The men of Israel chased the Philistines all the way, what are they doing? They're taking care of the ones that they can take care of. God took care of Goliath. The Israelites could take care of the rest of the Philistines. Who'd God take care of? The ones that had too much gas in the tank for Joshua and his men. The ones that were too strong for him. Who'd he take? The ones that God needed to take. But see, this is very peculiar portion of Scripture. As I was thinking yesterday, Brother Ron, brought Mike out of nowhere, Mike Goodson texts me out of the blue. I said, hey, let me ask you a question. I've been chewing on this. I said, other than this passage that we just read, and during Christ's crucifixion, you were anywhere in the Bible where God held the sun in the sky or made the sun move? do something that he wasn't supposed to. He said, nope, them the only two that I know about. I said, me too. I've been reading. Can't find any references to anything else. But he's saying, Brother Jordan, I mean, right here, it says that there never was a day before that or after it that God held the sun in the sky to where it wouldn't set. 
That means it's worth paying attention to. This time, God kept the sun from going down. We don't have time to read it, but if you go over into the Gospels and you read about the crucifixion of Christ, we know that at some point in the crucifixion process, he had to become our sacrificial lamb. And what had to happen? He had to have the sins of the world, past, present, and future, placed upon him to become our propitiation. God imparted upon Christ all the sins of man that man would ever commit. And when that happened, Jesus on the cross cried, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, meaning, my God, my God, why is that for sake? God had to break fellowship and turn his back on his son. But as Christ was hanging there, what the world saw outwardly visage brought much more than a man. But God saw spiritually, which was all the sin of the world, now being associated with his perfect and lovely and darling son, as a sign that this was not just any ordinary man. Many signs happened that day. But one of them was God cut the lights out. And your Bible will tell you that God cut the lights out so that man could not see what had become of God's perfect only begotten son. God didn't want others to see what he currently was. They wanted him to remember who he was and then they wanted him to see what he would be when he got back up out the grave. But he said, my son doesn't deserve to be seen in this situation. He had just broken fellowship with him. But as a decency, he says, I could still right, keep others from seeing what he had to become. So what's he do? He makes the sun set early. Out of nowhere, all of a sudden, it's just gone. The Bible says about three hours. One of the many signs. Now, I don't know about you. Y'all remember when that solar eclipse happened not too long ago? What, about five years ago or so? Everything looked weird outside. But we weren't in the exact perfect pinhole where everything got blocked out. But you know how long everything was completely dark? About 30 seconds. And even in that situation, the moon was there, but you could still see the sun's outline around the moon. I believe they call that the corona. What's that mean? Even when the moon gets in front of it, you can still tell that the sun is shining. Okay, we know the sun rises in the east, sets in the west. We know that the sun doesn't stop. It's always trailing across the sky. Well, on one day, God froze it in place for Joshua. And then on another day, which is the only other time that I can find in your Bible where God changed the course of the sun. What did he do? He made it disappear early. Now you'd think if it was the only two times that something like that happened, God might be trying to show you something. God doesn't do anything by accident or chance, but I know he only held it in the sky one time. Why? To make a point. And I know he did it for Christ. Why? To make a point. But see, when that sun disappeared, it was before Christ had died. He was still alive on the cross. And the Bible said that he would spend three days and three nights. Didn't say three days and two and a half nights. It said three full days and three full nights. That's why a lot of people got a problem trying to figure out when Jesus was crucified because they're not counting right. Why? Because the first one don't count. They buried him after the sun had already... He had to spend three full days, three full... Why was the sun disappeared? Because God took it away. It was already nighttime. First one wasn't three full days and three... You know, a full night. They, after this, they had to go prepare his body. Who knows what time eventually he was laid in the tomb. But it wasn't a full night. By God dark the sun out one so that he could raise on Sunday otherwise he'd have got up at about I don't know 9pm on a Saturday 
Not many people around when the sun's down on a Saturday evening. Why did the sun have to go down when Jesus was on the cross? It was a picture, literally, of all the things that you can imagine. But all of a sudden you see Jesus hanging on the cross. He's already done witness to the thieves and sinners on each side of them. One of them said, remember me when I enter into thy kingdom. He said, hey, today you're going to be with me in paradise. He's already looked at John, said, behold, thy mother referring to Mary, his mother. And he said, behold thy son, saying, John's going to take care of you. Because the eldest son's about ready to walk off the scene. That's the one that's going to take care of you. Not any of my brethren after flesh, John. He loved me supremely, and if I tell him to do it, he's going to do a better job than anybody I know. But all that happened on the cross. But why? Right before Christ. It says, it is finished. Why does the sun go out? Everybody saw and witnessed everything else. You go read Luke's account. He says, there's plenty of witnesses there that day to verify this is everything that happened. But before he says it is finished, God turns the light out. Why? One, so that you can't see what his son had to become in order to redeem your soul. But two, as a symbol of everything that Christ was getting ready to face for you. You think it freaked people out if the sun just disappeared right now? Oh, yeah. And not one where it's like, oh, hey, the eclipse is going to be happening. It's going to get a little bit darker. Then it's going to be real dark, but then it's going to get bright again. Now, I'm talking power just went out. You got no idea what happened, how long it's going to last. But all the things that you feared, all the things that when you laid your head down on your pillow at night and you was terrified, of facing for either all eternity or you terrified of facing in this world. But he's getting ready to walk into that darkness. He's getting ready to literally walk into hell and take your payment for sin. Take your punishment. He's getting ready to walk up to Satan and say, hey, give me a case of death hell in the grave. You didn't kill me, I'm still kicking around. I got some more business to do. Right, he goes and he preaches to all them saints in paradise. Why? Because he had to keep his promise to the thief on the cross. He said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So I know he went there at some point. All the things that he did, but, but what he had to do first, he had to walk into all of your darkness before he could come back out in his light. He had to go take care of your accounts, your business. Amen. If Joshua, if the sun had gone down, God had already taken care of business that day. They tuck tail, they's turning, they's running. But Joshua says, Lord, if you just let the sun stay in place, let the moon hang on the other side of the globe, just keep them there for a little bit, We'd like a little bit of victory today. We don't want a half win. We don't want a you know, partial celebration. Lord, we want to go back and tell them that the job was taken care of. You ever just had them days? We were like, Lord, I don't think I can handle this one more day. If I got to spend a little bit of extra time in the prayer closet, if I got to go back and listen to that preaching tape one more time, if I got to get back in here, spend another hour in the book for you to give me victory, Lord, just... Hold everything else in life. I just want a little bit of victory today. Was the war over? No, but that battle was. You say, well, they didn't win the war that day. No, but they won the battle. Then in the middle of a war, a little bit of victory will go a long way. In your life, just a little taste of victory could carry you through untold tomorrows. Why? Because you remember the time that the Lord showed up and said, all right, here's a little bit of victory. 
Didn't ask God to give it to him on the silver platter. He said, no, Lord, I want to work for it. I want to labor. I want to be a co-laborer with Christ. Christ told me to take up my cross. Lord, I want to bear it. I'm just asking that you keep the sun up a little bit longer so I can finish the run today instead of tomorrow. Lord, I don't know what tomorrow brings forth, but I know if you'll just give me a little bit more time today, I'll be able to cross that victory line, that finish line. I'll be able to get to where I'm supposed to be going. Then, Lord, I'll be able to go back and tell everybody else what you did for me. I won't be burdened about the problem that I might have to face tomorrow. I know it's already been taken care of today. But how'd that happen? God had to hold the sun in the sky. What had to happen in order for Jesus to take all that unknown, all those dark, all them things that you didn't know you was in the midst of when you was blind in sin? And when God turned the light on, why'd you get terrified deep down in your soul? Because you realized everything that you was around only brought death and destruction. You realized that you were damned for all of eternity. Already, it had been stamped on you. Couldn't change it. But it wasn't, well, if I do enough bad, then I'll spend all of eternity. No. You was born damned to hellfire. But what God do? He shut the light off. Jesus forsook all of his glory, all of his light, all of his life. And what did he do? He took your darkness. Amen. Now that's the thought. Why did the sun have to go out so that you could have the light? You don't get the light without Jesus taking your darkness. But because Jesus took your light, or your darkness... You can live victoriously in the light. God knew that the sun was going to be held up one day. What did he do? He knew one day he was going to put it back on schedule. When the day that Christ was hanging on the tree. All right, you remember where I put you the first time? Go back there. Why? Because he held it in the sky for a little bit. He held the moon in the same place where it was. He didn't mess things up too much. He did it in balance. But what happened? God said, all right, go back to where you used to be. What happened? Lights went out. God gave the Israelites a little bit of extra light, so what did he do? He just took it back. God does everything well. But see, Jesus hanging on the cross, paying your sin debt, what happened? He took your darkness. Why? So that when you need it, he can show up and say, hey, here's a little bit of light. I know you've been running all night. I know that after everything, you've already fought a battle. Now you're running again trying to catch up to them to fight another battle. And you know if they get away, it's going to be another battle and another battle. And I know that you're running. Right? These guys weren't giving up. They purpose purposed to finish it. Right? You'd get determined about what God has set in front of you. Lord, I'd really love to take care of this today. Lord, just let me be used to you. Lord, we've been chasing this for a long time. We've been fighting this battle for a long time. And just when you need it, Jesus shows up and says, Here, we're just going to keep the sun up for a little bit. Give you a little bit of extra time. Why? So that you can go down there, you can do what you can do. What Joshua do? Joshua knew how to swing a sword. Joshua knew how to call down hail or hailstones and fire from heaven like it happened on the Egyptian. No, Joshua didn't know how to do any of that. Joshua knew how to ride a horse and chase after people and swing a sword. What's he asking God? Lord, just let me do what I'm able to do. Right? Maybe instead of asking God to do everything for you, if you just say, Lord, I'm going to ride as long as it takes. But I know if the sun goes down, it's going to be harder to take care of this problem tomorrow. Joshua and the Israelites weren't at fault for the enemy turned tail like cowards and running away. It's not their fault that they had to ride all night. It's not their fault that they've been over a day without sleep. Then study, it says that the sun hung in the sky for a whole other day. Didn't move. How long the Israelites fight? They fought until they had no energy left. 
Well, I thought you said they'd been running and everything. Yeah, because once they got a little taste of victory, their gas tank was charged up again. They's able to finish the fight. They're losing hope. They're saying, man, they're going to get away. They're getting a little bit farther and a little bit farther. God killed a whole lot of them, but there's still some left. Because even after a whole day of fighting afterwards, what's the Bible say? God killed more of them with hailstones than they killed with the sword. And they had a whole day to run them down and kill them. Where God said, son, stay there. They're going to get another day of fighting. You get a little bit of victory, that battle that ends up being a whole lot longer than you thought, it's going to be gone in the blink of an eye to you. Why? Because you're soaking up the victory that God's given you in it. You think any of them boys cared about how tired they were when they were seeing the people that were responsible for causing all that death, destruction, and mayhem? They said, nope, we're going to take care of business. They weren't tired. They were elated that God gave them a chance to go back to other people and give them a taste of victory. Say, so, you know that guy that caused you all that trouble? You're never going to see him again. Did you kill him? Nope, God delivered him into my hand. Now, it's just the sword, but God did all the work. Jesus took all your darkness so that other people would see his light shining in your life. They come back to camp and they say, well, who made the sun stand in the sky? They say, well, Joshua said, sun standing away. He said, I wasn't talking to you all. Go back and read it. Verse number 12. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the Israelites and said in the sight of all Israel. He said, I wasn't talking to you jokers. I wasn't even talking to the sun. I was just talking to God. And I just said, Lord, let the sun stay there. Now you say, that's a pretty silly thing to ask. Wasn't it Joshua? This is a guy that ever since he came out of Egypt, he's just been watching God do things that he can't explain, understand, or begin to wrap his head around. He's watched Moses talk to God so many times that he knows when God's doing something, you know what, you'll find Joshua, he's flat on his face worshiping God. Joshua don't know, want no glory. Joshua just wants to be used of God like he has his whole life. And he's just praying to God and he says, Lord, I don't know any other way that this is going to work out. God had a whole bunch of ways he could have made it work out, but Joshua couldn't figure out any of them. But then the thought had him, he said, you know what, Lord? If we just had a little bit more time, we'd be able to end this thing today. The Lord, if you'd allow it, keep the sun right there, keep the moon where it's at, and just give us enough daylight to take care of these suckers. And what happened? God did it. Amen. Why? Because he asked. Believing. Without doubt. Knowing that God could, and just said, Lord, if you would, it'd be great to have a little bit of victory today. But what happens when they get back to camp and everybody says, oh, Joshua held it in the sky. He said, no, I didn't, you dummies. God did it. Well, we heard you say it, and he said, I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to God. Listen to your own prayer life. Stop cutting in on mine. But he said it in, all, in front of all the people of Israel there with him. They say, Joshua, when you said that, who was you talking to? Oh, I was talking to God. Why did Jesus take of the darkness that day on the day of Calvary? Why did he do that? So that when God gives you a little bit of victory, you come back, you got a little bit of shine on your face like Moses did when he came down off the mountain. And people see his light in your life. Why? Because he just held the sun over you a little bit longer today. It gave you a little bit of victory. So that when you go back to others, you can say, it wasn't me. I just cried out because I knew we wasn't going to catch them. I knew if the sun went down, they was going to get away. I knew God could have killed them all there with hailstones, but I wanted us to finish it. He said, God had already won the battle. We just wanted to be the cleanup crew. We just wanted the victory of being able to say that the Lord used us to help the people, God's people. They're saying we wanted to be servants is what they're really saying. We didn't want the glory. We didn't want the credit. We just wanted God to use us. We didn't want them coming back and causing more problems the next day or next month or next year. We said, Lord, if you'll let us in this, we'll fight until we can't fight no more. You say, well, you guys were gone for a real long time. 
Yeah, a whole extra day. Y'all didn't notice that the sun was up? People are going to pay attention if the sun don't go down for over a day. Right? If the Lord just decides to stop the sun in your life, let Jesus shine on you a little bit, people all around you are going to notice. Sun didn't just stop for Joshua and his men. No, it stopped for everybody. Every now and then, God gives you a little bit of victory that's so bright, that's so undeniable, that people got to stop and take a look and say, what in the world is going on over there? How many times did God do something? And it says that, the Bible, that people turned and looked. Moses stopped, saw the, burst, the bush that was on fire, and it says, and he turned and said, that's not normal. He could have, he glanced it and he was like, a oh, bush on fire. But then when he realized that bush wasn't burning, but yet it was on fire, he stopped and turned to look at it. Why? Because it was something out of the ordinary. But the master of the feast, when Jesus turned the water into wine, he said, hey, why'd y'all save the best for last? They said, we, we didn't do it. We ran out. And that fellow right there, he turned it into wine. Turned what into wine? Water. What water? The water that we use to wash our hands and feet when we come in. You mean we're drinking foot and hand water? No, you're drinking wine because he changed it. And you just said it was the best. As soon as it hit his lips, he knew this ain't the stuff that we normally get. It's something better. You didn't have to tell him. May have been the same color. May have smelled the same. Right, but you didn't have to tell. He knew this is a whole lot better than what we've had all day today. He probably thinking, this is better than anything I've had in my life. Where'd they get this from? Because he's the one that went out and bought the first ones. The taste tested it and said, I want the best. Right, today's the day of a wedding. We want to send them off in style. He's saying, I tested all them different kind of ways. And guess what? This one still beats them all. What happens? It was undeniable. Because when the Lord does it, he does it unlike man can do it. Did Joshua walk away, pounding his chest that day, saying, man, we whipped him, Amorites? No, he said, man, it was good for God to show up and do something for us. Only God can take credit for it. If God wanted to, he'd have thrown more hailstones down, they all would have died. Why'd he leave a little bit? What? Because he wanted to give them victory. He didn't want the people of Israel to say, well, well, God showed up and did it again. Right? We didn't need Joshua. No, he was reinforcing that Joshua was God's man for God's people. That God used Joshua to accomplish what God wanted to do. Why? So that they could look at Joshua and say, God gave him victory, and through him we can have victory. Well, why did Jesus take all that darkness on the, so that you could look at back to the cross and say because he took all of my defeat my damnation my destruction now I can have victory through Christ I can walk in the light I can live victoriously not because of anything I've done but because he took all of my darkness the rest of your eternity according to your Bible was outer darkness it was weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth what Jesus do he took that for you why? So that you could have light. Did he not say that he was the light of the world? So don't you expect if Jesus just shows up and shows out in your life that the sun's going to stand still for a little bit? He doesn't do it for no reason. God doesn't just stop by when you aren't looking for him. God does, doesn't stop by when he knows nobody's not going to be there. Why'd God hold the sun in the sky? Because Joshua was right where he needed to be and he asked something in the perfect will of God. If it wasn't God's will, it wouldn't happen. Then it says, for once, on one day, never happened before, never had happened since, God said, you know what, Joshua, that is a pretty good idea. He already knew Joshua was going to say it. God had already seen that he had done it before Joshua was even born. But he says, you know what, Joshua? because your heart's in the right place because you're in the right place because your request is in line with my will I'll grant it 
Bible says that we don't receive. Why? Because we ask amiss. Amiss of what? We miss the will of God with our request. If you just start praying what God wants you to pray, who knows the sun might shine a little bit more. Might get a little bit more victory. Why? Because Christ took all of your darkness. He took everything that was going to divide you and separate you, and he replaced it with what? Light and victory. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.